but we're not doing that. We're too preoccupied um, with uh, outcomes and we're preoccupied with social grievances and we're preoccupied with destroying or, or ripping down a system instead of, we, so the Aubrey Lodge phrase I think is very useful here. The master's tools cannot disable the master's house. You know, the master's, you can't dissemble the, the, ma the master's house is patriarchy, white supremacy, et cetera. The tools that built the house are reason, evidence, epistemic adequacy, science. And so all of those conceptions are um, considered to be null and void in terms of they just perpetuate the system. It's called privilege preserving epistemic pushback. You just threw in a word there, white supremacy, that I, I just want to pick up before we move on. Uh, it's a term you didn't hear very much five or 10 years ago. It basically mm -hmm. meant people in white hoods carrying uh, flaming torches through the streets and, uh, and you know, neo-Nazis. Now white supremacy is everywhere and nowhere. Do you know what it means? Well, the semantic range of white supremacy has um, expanded significantly for that. And Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay and cynical theories talk about this. It's an, it's a, it's an important point. And so there were, and there still are literal uh, Ku Klux Klan members. Fortunately, that's decreasing. There's some wonderful work, just parenthetically, by Daryl Davis on that. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend Daryl Davis's work. He's a black guy who goes in to speak to Klan's members, befriends them, and they give him their abnegated hoods. It's a, a utterly mind, like genuinely mind blowing. I don't know any other way to say it, but balls of steel. <laughs> uh, you can um, say that we're on an australian prison <laughs> island apparently so. okay <laughs> you can get okay, away with a little, little saucy okay. language all right that's my saucy language for today so um so the range of that so now i published an article of i think in 2014 that said privilege is the original sin so it's a kind of whiteness is a kind of stain and if you look at ibrahim kendi Tahanahasi Coates, Robin D'Angelo, there's something intrinsic to the property of whiteness that is or, or is, is inherently racist. And John McWhorter and Coleman Hughes and Glenn Lowry have written very elegant, elegantly um, rebutting that. But that's the problem if you don't buy into disputation and argumentation and debate and dialectic is that you don't even listen to that. Why bother? You have your lived experience. Mm. Well, also, they're not real uh, people of color because they're not talking Correct. the way that the orthodoxy would require them to i mean i you know i have many of those people are my friends and the amount of shit that they have to put up with online about being called you know uncle toms or something because Correct. they diverge from what they're supposed to think as good people of color is so horrifying. so correct so lived experience is only lived experience and we'll re relate this to diversity which is very important it's only lived experience if it comports with the narrative so when you hear diversity you're not merely diversity. When you hear diversity, you just translate it as intellectual homogeneity. So, excuse me, Larry Elder, who's running for governor of California after the recall of Gavin Newsom, he is not considered to be a diverse candidate because he holds uh, um, views that just don't comport with the orthodoxy. So, mm -hmm. even even there, when you're talking about what is diversity, you know, what what is what is the lived experience of a, well, the lived experience of a black man means he's not really. He's not a true black. I mean, what was the thing Biden said? Uh, you know, how, how can you I can't vote for Trump? You're not a true black. I, I can't remember what it was. He said some something like, "If you don't vote for me, then you're not real. You're not really black." Yeah, something oh. utterly deranged. As if you know, you, you see the same thing with Muslims. You know, when people who aren't Muslims look at somebody and, and they paint the whole brush by the by the extremist section. So so someone's not a real Muslim unless they're blowing stuff up, right? So they. So it's a kind of injustice that they do toward people who believe. And in fact, you can be, I know that this is a hard, not, not for you, I hope, but you can be black and, or white or Jewish or Asian. You can be Asian, not good at math. You, a friend of mine I do jujitsu with told me a funny story. He was at a restaurant. He's a Korean. He's at a restaurant and uh, uh, they were divvying up the bill at the end and they just hand, they handed him the bill. He's like, what are you handing me the bill for? And everyone said, well, you're good at math. Like the assumption, the assumption was, he thought it was, he didn't think it was a microaggression. He thought it was really funny, but you know, you can be Asian and not be good at math. You can be black and be conservative. You can be white and have your identity marker tells you nothing about what you believe. 
That's right. And yet it does tell you something about some of the experiences that you might have had, which is what leads people to believe that they have greater standing to hold an opinion about something if they have a lived experience, right? I mean, I have just never experienced racism. I've experienced homophobia because I'm married to a man. I've experienced anti-Semitism because I'm, I'm a Jew. I, 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 there are certain experiences that I've never had and when you talk about like oh what about the disadvantaged working class white person who is supposed right. who supposedly carries around this white privilege well right. then this person is not privileged on in econ economic sense but it is true to say that they have never faced the fact of racial discrimination for being a person of color right so i would i would put forth this so let's say that you aggregate the lived, again, but even to aggregate the lived experiences of people, you need to use some kind of science. You need to use surveys. You need to, you know, you're not, you, you just can't get around using the tools of science at some point, but okay, let's just go with it for a second. But even in those cases, if there's anti-Semitism or homophobia or some kind of um, a bigotry, what, just as, a, as, as a, a pedestrian, but important example in this country, because it comes up so frequently, are black people pulled over by the police more than white people? Right. This is not a difficult question to answer. In fact, it couldn't possibly be any simpler, barring some wrenches that are in there. You can use the tools of science to test that. So if black people say, well, look, this is you know, terrible. We're, we're being pulled over by the police and we don't like it. But you don't hear those complaints by white people. What you would do is then you could conduct a study on it, right? Like you could look at body cams and you could correlate because every time they pull someone over, they read the license uh, in, into a database. Like you can use the tools of science to figure out if those claims are true. And then you can make public policies to say, okay, so this is a problem. So what do we do about it? You know, like how do we address these problems? But even then, the personal experience only leads you to think about what kind of tools of science you can impose to, to give policymakers the most accurate data before they make decisions.